By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Paladins of the North Cup, the old school tournament of Groningen, the Netherlands. And uh, in today's episode, we are going to look at a second round match between Martijn, who's playing Green Stompy, and he's taking on Ron, who's playing his famous Rook Valley deck. So I'm really looking forward to see these two decks clash. Green Stompy, of course, is a very aggressive deck that wants to go really quickly. And the Rook Valley deck is, I, I would say, almost a burn deck when I'm looking at this list. It also has some uh, aggressiveness in it as well. So these could be very short games when I'm looking at both of these players' lists. Now, before I start with the match, I always do a deck deck. Now, if you want to skip these, uh, the easiest way to do that is by checking the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games, and if you click on there, it will take you straight to the game action. And for now, I'm going to continue with the deck decks. I've got deck photos of both of these decks, and I'm going to start with the deck of Martijn Green Stompy. And here we see the deck photo of Martijn. So like I said, it's green stompy, right? So just a lot of smaller green creatures. They get pumped by Pendlehaven. In this case, there's also White Lily Wolf, who's doing some pumping as well. Um, by the way, looking at this deck photo, I think Martijn is definitely a minimalist. <laughs> this is like very like simple. This is it. Um, I assume that those creatures, most of them are in here with a full playset. If that's the case, then I'm counting two, four, six. Uh, one one creatures six times four makes 24 so 24 creatures in the deck then maybe I can count the Mishra's factories in there as well then we're at 28 um, and as you can see he's playing with three Pendlehavens and it actually makes sense in this deck because you don't really mind having a Pendlehaven in play and a Pendlehaven in hand because just the casting cost of these creatures is so cheap like you need two mana maybe three mana tops to cast your uh, your ice storm so I kind of understand this decision. A little neat trick with the Pendlehaven is, by the way, you can tap your Pendlehaven to pump one of your 1-1 one -one creatures. Then you can play your other Pendlehaven. That would mean that the tapped one will leave play. And then you can pump another creature again for plus one, plus two. And that could actually be relevant because this is one of these decks, you know, they want a game uh, uh, to last extremely short. It is super aggressive. Um, you know, I think Martin is going to go burn through his hand very, very quickly. There's no card draw on this, no Sylvan Library, nothing. It's just, it's really one strategy that is attack, attack, attack. Put those giant growths on, see if you can find the right moment um, to use your Berserk. Berserk, of course, is also really good in combination with Pendlehaven and in combination with Wailudu Wolf. So Wailudu Wolf, the creature from Arabian Nights, one green and one, you can tap it to give target creature plus one plus one. So what you could basically have is a scenario where you attack, for example, with your script sprites, you pump it with your Pendlehaven, making it a two, three, then you tap your Waluli Wolf, making it a three, four flyer. Then you put a giant grove on it, making it a six, seven. Then you put a berserk on it. And before you know it, your opponent has 12 points of damage. And what if you have double berserk, then your opponent dies on the spot, right? So this is definitely a deck that can actually do that, you know? And, and I'm now wondering, by the way, Martijn, if you're also playing with a full playset of Berserks, let us know if you're watching this video. I would love to hear that from you. Um, just a little focus on the sideboard, because I see a uh, Shadow, Shadow, Din, Shadow Din Dryads, the 1-1 one, one, uh, creature with Forced Walk for one green to cast. I think it's just a beautiful card, and I'm just really happy to see it being played at a tournament. So it's great uh, uh, to have it here at the uh, second round of the Paladins of the North Cup. Okay, this is the deck of Martijn. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Ron. And here we see Ron's Rook Valley deck. Now this is a strong deck, and maybe it's good to first kind of focus on Rook Egg, right? Because that's kind of one of the main players in this deck, and Ron is a big favorite of that card as well. So Rook Egg being an 0-3 creature, uh, and the unique thing is when it dies, you get a 4-4 bird token at the end of turn. So basically what you want to do is you want to get your Rook Egg uh, fried into an omelet. You want to get it killed as quickly as possible. One of the, um, the most renowned combinations and also um, the, where the name of this deck comes from is by combining Rook Egg with Diamond Valley. So Diamond Valley is a land from the Arabian Nights. You can tap it to sack target creature and then you gain life, target creature you control by the way, and then you gain life equal to the toughness of that creature. So you can use your Diamond Valley to sack your Rook Egg, then you gain three life, and then at the end of turn you also get your 4-4 four, four bird token. So that's kind of sweet, right? Uh, but there are more ways that lead to roam in this deck. You've also got Chain Lightning, which is pretty cool. You play Chain Lightning uh, for one red on your own Rook Egg, 
And then if you've got two red open, you can pay those two red and then you can choose a new target for your chain lightning. So maybe if you have two rook eggs, you can use one chain lightning to kill both of them. You get two four four flyers. Or if you've got one rook egg, you can kill your rook egg and then you can point it uh, the chain lightning towards your opponent's life total or maybe a creature that's low enough. I think in this case, a creature, right? Because all those green creatures are pretty weak. Um, talking about that, I think this is a really difficult matchup for the mono green player because we also have four lightning bolts, which are just perfect to take out that early pressure. Um, we also have Mishra's factories here. The Atox are kind of good. Uh, the black vices, of course, are not so good because I think the green player is just going to empty his hand very quickly. But then again, of course, he can feed the vices to the Atok and after game two, he can board them out if he wants to. So I don't really think it's a major problem. Another thing that makes this deck really strong, of course, is all the power. I mean, just, just look at it. We've got all the Moxen, we've got Ancestral Recall, we've got Time Twister, we've got Time Walk. Uh, you know, we've got the Lotus, of course, like everything is here. Uh, to make this deck very powerful and very brutal. We also see some like usual suspect inclusions here, the balance, the mind twist, demonic tutor, all really good cards, understandable that they're in here. Um, and they can also change a game. Uh, what's also interesting here are the three Psy Blasts. A Psy Blast, of course, a card from blue. One blue, two to cast an instant, deals four damage to any target and two damage to you. And the reason I find it interesting, it's really good to kind of get rid of that famous 4-4, you know, white flyer. Of course, I'm talking about the Sarah Angel here. Um, but it's also just really good for his direct damage plan. I mean, he's playing four bolts, two chain, uh, a chain lightning, three side blasts. So, I mean, direct damage really gets him a long way. I mean, if, if his Rook Egg plan isn't working, he can just go on the aggro, you know. Um, also, Atok is a super annoying creature to deal with with all the mocks and, and, and devices. Um, for an opponent because it attacks and you're like, okay, if I block it, he's going to sack some artifacts and kill, kill a creature that I don't want to lose. But if I don't block it, he can sack a lot of artifacts and maybe he can kill me on the spot, especially in a deck uh, that has so much direct damage as well. So I think this deck is really good at, at getting early pressure on. And, and that's actually exactly what the mono green player wants to do. But I really think looking at these two lists, that, you know, Ron is definitely the strong favorite in this matchup. Okay, we've looked at the deck of Ron. We've looked at the deck of his opponent, Martijn. And that means that it's now time to go to the match. Let's see how this is going to end up between Green Stompy and Rook Valley. Game number one is about to begin. We've got Ron sitting on the right there with the um, Icy Manipulator off control playmat. He is on the play, I believe. He's playing the Rook Valley deck. And on the left, we have Martijn with his mono green deck, Green Stompy. Let's take a look what Ron can do here at the opening. Just playing a Mishra's Factory, it seems, and a pass turn. And let's see if Martijn has a one drop. Ooh, I guess not, because he's playing a strip mine, taking care of the factory and passing. Hoping to slow Ron down. And of course, for him, the factory is quite annoying because he's got so many 1-1 one -one creatures that want to attack. So he doesn't want Ron to have a potential blocker. And now Ron is really in the tank here. What is he going to do? Playing out a dual land. It's kind of hard to see which one this is. They are altered, as you can see. There's also a Black Lotus. He's going to crack the Lotus. Okay, now it's getting exciting. He's going to make a big move. And there's, okay, there's a Manifold. That means he still has two. And okay, Demonic Tutor. I mean, he could do several things. He could choose to go for a Mind Twist. But he could also choose to go for, um, just for an Ancestral Recall. Because I believe that Dual Land, could it be a Volcanic Island? Because then he has blue mana at his disposal. And he could play an Ancestral Recall. It looks like he's, he's a little bit wondering what he wants to do. And how he used his mana. Because I guess the way he uses mana now, it's 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 not a good idea to look up an, um, a mind twist because he doesn't have any black mana left anymore from the black lotus. Looking at his hand again, seems to be changing his mind or not. Going through the deck again, I think I would kind of go for probably the boring play, which is a Black Lotus, but uh, uh, sorry, an Ancestral Recall. But maybe he wants to do something more exciting. Who knows? Or maybe he already has that card in hand. 
It's hard to see what the light, what Cardi is now looking at. I mean, Ron is making this really exciting. He makes me want to guess for this. Okay, there he goes, shuffling up again. Uh, Ron is also the organizer, by the way, of the Often Troll Cup held every year in Leeuwarden. There's also a video series on that here on the channel. It's just been, uh, always been a great tournament. I believe it was the second edition that was uh, this year. A lot of fun. And I'm already looking forward to the next one. If you're ever around near Leeuwarden, uh, just check out when the Often Troll Cup is. I think you can find them on Facebook and Instagram. It's really a great event. Anyway, he's cutting his deck here, putting the cards back. Now let's see what it's going to be. So there goes the Demonic Tutor. And passing turn. And then in his upkeep, exactly, Ancestral Recall. So I wonder what he was thinking about, what his other options were. Because it kind of seems like a no-brainer. There's a green here, and oh, this is pretty good. The crumble is really good. I'm liking this play by Martin. The only problem that Martin has right now is that he's supposed to be the aggressive player, and yet he hasn't dealt a single point of damage yet, which I think is in the advantage of Ron, whose his deck seems stronger on the long run. And there's a Mishra's Factory, by the way, from Ron, and here is a Pendlehaven. Are we going to see a Wailuli Wolf, for example? No, we're going to see a Scavenger Folk followed up by a Scrip Sprites. So the 1-1 one, one Flyer. That Scavenger Folk also being pretty good. You can pay one green, tap and sack it to destroy target artifact. And that works really well against those Mishra's Factories. There is another dual land. And Ron here taking his time. I mean, you've got to think about, do you want to play an artifact right now with that Scavenger Folk, for example, on the board? Or do you first want to take care of the Scavenger Folk? And there he goes. Are we going to see a bolt on the Scavenger Folk here? Ooh, a Chain Lightning, but not on the Scavenger Folk, on the Pixies instead. So he's not worried about the scavenger. There's an ATOC and a pass. I like this ATOC as kind of an answer to the uh, to the scavenger folk. I do understand the chain lightning on the script sprites, by the way, because Ron probably knows, okay, I'm playing against green. Green can be super explosive. He could attack, play a double giant growth, whatever, play a couple of berserks and I'm dead, you know? So. He's probably thinking about that scenario, and that's the main reason why he chained um, the, um, the script sprites. And also nice to note here is that uh, Martin was, of course, tapped out, so he couldn't respond with, for example, a giant growth to kind of save the creature. So that made it a great moment for Ron to, uh, to play the chain lightning. Here we see a new script sprites and a pass turn. So interestingly enough, no attack here from the scavenger folk that could have been an option. Instead, uh, Martin chooses to kind of keep it untapped to respond to a possible artifact. There is a Mind Twist. That is pretty brutal. So perhaps Ron was looking up the Mind Twist with the Demonic Tutor and already had the Ancestral in hand. That's, of course, a possibility as well. And uh, this is really, really br brutal for Martin. I mean, having a game where you have to face an Ancestral Recall and a Mind Twist, I mean, that's going to make it really difficult for, uh, for Martin. I think he... Only has one option here, just just to kind of try to deal as much damage as he possibly can. He seems to animate the factory right here. He's going to attack with both, keeping Pendle... Ooh, all three. Of course, he's got the Pendle Haven to pump up his scavenger folk. So this kind of makes sense. I'm expecting Ron just to take the damage here. Exactly. So we are going to see five points of damage. He's going to drop to 16. And there's a pass. Of course, he gained that one life from the crumble, by the way. It took, for, it took a moment for me to realize, like, why is he on 21? But that was a crumble earlier on the Mana Vault. Tapping all four. Are we going to see a Suchi here? Or a Rook Egg, of course. We're going to see a Rook Egg. And this is the nice thing about the Rook Egg. The Rook Egg wants to be surprised by a Giant Grove. It doesn't care. So in that way, it's like a great blocker. 
and he's not attacking with the uh, ATOC. That's kind of interesting. I guess if you're, you're more tinier, you can just attack again with everything, just like you did in the previous turn, because you still have that Pendlehaven, except, of course, you've got something in hand that you want to play out. I guess that's the case, because he's only uh, attacking with his 1-1 one -one flyer, pumping it with Pendlehaven. Ooh, this is interesting. This is interesting, because I was expecting Martin to kind of play something out after that combat phase. So I wonder if Martin has some kind of instant in hand that he wants to use now. Of course, he only has two cards after the brutal mind twist. Ron is really in the lead here. And there's a bolt on his own rook egg. That means on end step, he's going to get a 4-4 bird token, which is a big problem here for Martijn. And a passing turn. Yeah, so the 4-4 the, the four four bird token comes on your end step. So technically, if you put it into play, straight away you're kind of saying to your opponent it's your turn now obviously old school is quite relaxed so people won't hold that against you but it's it's a nice thing to know i know that ron knows this by the way because he's played rook egg so so long he, he loves these uh, rook egg decks and here's a, a pass turn from martin so that's kind of telling me that martin doesn't have for example a giant grove in hand or else he could have attacked used pendlehaven and giant grove to kill the 4-4 bird if ron decided to block Here we see another duel from the side of Ron. And for Ron, it's kind of waiting for the right moment when to start putting some pressure on. But it is difficult because, again, he knows how explosive the green deck can be. And he probably kind of wants to wait here. It's very tempting to now kind of attack with your 4-4 bird. But then also you're opening up the skies for Martijn for an attack. And I mean, again, I'm just going to say it again. The deck is super explosive. If he, if he uses Pendlehaven on the, um, on the script sprites, it's a 2-3. Then use a Giant Grove, it becomes a 5-6. And if he then has a Berserk, that means 10 points of damage for, uh, for Ron. And that would be uh, pretty devastating. So maybe the best thing to do here is just to pass turn. Sometimes it works like that in Magic, that the best thing to do is just pass. Of course, I don't know what's in the hand of Ron. I mean, if he's got a good play to make, go for it. Or perhaps he is going to attack with uh, with the bird. Looking at his lance again, looking at his hand again. Discussing the amount of creatures that he sees on the side of Martin, doing some counting. I think I see a shatter there, and he is attacking with the bird token. So he is putting some pressure on. And I guess uh, Martin can just take this damage. He was still in 20 anyway, so he's going to drop to 16. And there's the untap. And the question now is, can Martin take advantage of this moment? He's got the skies open. He can at least hit for three, uh, sorry, for two. That would mean Ron would drop here to 12. So if he uses the Pendlehaven now, which is kind of what I expect... And there's no lightning bolt from Ron, so Ron's going to drop to 12. Not a big deal, of course. But if you're the green player, you're like, okay, I'm still kind of in this. Even after that ancestral recall and that mind twist. There's probably another attack for four, so Ron is choosing to put the pressure on here. And I mean, that means that Martin is now on a three-turn clock, right? He's on 12. So he's got to start thinking about that bird now. Looks like he's going to tap four. Are we going to see another Rook Egg? There's another Rook Egg. And I mean, it would be ideal for Rana to kind of find a Chain Lightning next turn. Because he's got enough red as well to end chain his own Rook Egg and then uh, pay two red again and choose a new target. Potentially targeting the only flyer on the side of Martin. That would be like an ideal scenario for Ron. I guess we're first going to see an attack. I think this is a good decision. If you're Martin, you know, my only way to kind of win this... Is, it's just by going for the life total. That's what your deck does. And even though you're low on cards and all that, just you got to keep sticking to that plan. There's another flyer. And I mean, I'm just hoping for Martijn's sake that Ron cannot find a way to kill his own Rook Egg because that would be kind of devastating for Martijn.
Ron again looking at his hand here. Four cards in hand, I believe. I mean, it's just not an ideal scenario for Ron. I, I, I feel like Martin is really kind of getting back into this. He's swarming the board, which is what he wants to do. He's getting more and more creatures on there. I think if you're Ron and you don't have a way to kill your own Rook Egg, I would probably keep the, um, the bird token now on guard duty. Because if not, you're going to drop to 7, which is, seems quite low. I mean, I, I mean if, if he's got like a bolt in hand, he can attack no problem. He can even then use his bolt in his own egg at a 4-4 flyer. Or, you know, use the bolt in one of the flyers on the side of Martin as soon as he uses the Pendlehaven. This is an interesting matchup, and you can kind of see Ron trying to go through all the scenarios in his head. What is the best thing to do? Of course you want to keep the pressure on, and you know you can deal four more points of damage, but I think it's a good decision that he's not doing that, but just passing turn. And Martijn, of course, finding another card. I think a Giant Grove would just be so, so good here. A Berserk could also be interesting. And he is passing turns. So it's kind of showing again to Ron that he doesn't have a giant growth or a berserk in hand. And there we see another duel. And Ron staring at his hand. What can he do? Two, four, six lands available. And I don't believe he plays with a fireball. Fireball would be really good against his deck. Six mana and a firewall, he could take out a lot of creatures here on the side of Martang. And just passing turn, so kind of a stalemate scenario here, which is interesting. Martang being on 12, Ron being on 10. There's another pass, okay, so I guess the good news for Ron here is that Martang is not putting any more creatures on the board. Now remember, Ron is playing with one balance. There we see a Mox Sapphire. Oh, there's a Chaos Orb. That's kind of interesting. He could now decide to attack. Oh, he's gonna, or is he going to flip the orb first? Remember, by the way, oh, I almost forgot this. Uh, Martijn still has a very annoying scavenger folk, so all Martijn has to do is kind of wait until Ron decides to... Oh, there's a Wheel of Fortune! Wow, and that is so interesting. There we see a crumble on the Chaos Orb. In response, he can use the Chaos Orb, but then in response, Martijn can use the scavenger folk. I wonder what he's going to do. He could also decide just not to... Yeah, he's going to, of course, target his own Rook Egg. Interesting, because Martijn could have chosen here to use his Scavenger Folk. Let's see if, if Ron can hit this one. Yep, that's a good hit. That's a really nice flip, by the way. And that means he's going to get the token uh, on his end step. But first, these players are going to draw new cards. Oh, it looks like Martijn wants to do something else before discarding. Oh, he could have played that second crumble on the Chaos Orb. I'm a little bit confused that he didn't do that. Maybe, maybe Martijn has his reasons, but I think what I would have done... Oh, there's also a Giant Grove in hand. Interesting. Wow, he actually had a lot of interesting cards in hand there. I think what I would have done, um, but again, I'm sure Martijn has his, has his reasons, but I would have uh, played the second crumble on the Chaos Orb uh, as well. On the other hand, I mean, Ron is going to draw a whole new hand. I mean, the chances that he's going to find something to kill his own uh, Rook Egg is also really, really big. Let's see if we can find some more Moxen. And of course, the Mox is a really good card with that Aatok on the board. So I do understand Martijn's play. I'm not saying one play is better than the other, but it's just interesting to always discuss 
all the different scenarios. Maybe let me know in the comments below what you would have done in this situation. Perhaps you would have also sacked the scavenger folk. And he's tapping now, maybe for one red. Oh, there's a vice. Yeah, and of course, vice and wheel of fortune. A very good combination. That means three points of damage for Martin the next turn, probably. And then he's going to nine. So maybe he's trying to see if he's got another crumble to play on that black vice. Already played two crumbles out in this match. And now Ron is entirely tapped out, so he's got a pass. So it's up to Martano to decide, does he want to do something in end step? He's going to go through the graveyard here, Ron, to see how many crumbles has he actually played out. Two crumbles in there. And also a scavenger folk. He could have, of course, also used a scavenger folk to destroy the black vice. And that way kind of save three points of damage. Also not a bad deal. Plus... You know, the scavenger folk, the, the Black Vice is really good with that Atok on board. I think that's what he's going to do. I think this is a good decision. Because he's going to save three life, and he's basically taking away a pump spell for the Atok, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I kind of understand Martin here. Drawing a card, that means he's now up to seven cards again, I believe. There we see a forest. What is he gonna do? Oh, and of course he's got, by the way, he's got now seven in hand because he used the scavenger folk to get rid of the vice. So not a, not a card from his hand, sorry for that. So he's, he's got seven in hand right now, which is good news for Martin. I mean, he's gotta be able to empty it. If he's got a growth in hand, he could just attack with both the the script sprites. There's a white lily wolf. So now he can do that little trick where you first use your Pendlehaven on a creature and then you use your white lily wolf. So he can give a creature plus two, plus three now. Ooh, he's gonna play something interesting. Okay, there's another white lily wolf. That is actually, those white lily wolves are pretty good in this scenario. Obviously, he cannot use them yet because they have summoning sickness. So there is kind of a little opening here for Ron. So he could choose to go to get really aggressive. Ooh, this Diamond Valley is really good for Ron. He can use the Diamond Valley to sack his creatures and gain some extra life if need be. So if a blocking situation is uh, is working against him because of a, because of a Giant Grove, for example, he can simply say, you know what, before damage is dealt. I'm going to use my valley and I'm going to gain some life. <laughs> going through his hand again. Of course, he's got a lot of options after that Wheel of Fortune, but it's looking really good for Ron here. I think that Diamond Valley kind of really changed a lot for him. There is a Suchi. I wonder if he's going to attack with a bird here. Of course, Ron knows as well that those Walulu Wolves now still have Summoning Sickness, but next turn that will have uh, completely changed. So, you know, basically now he's got an opening. Then again, you know, if his opponent has a Giant Growth, he can simply kill it with a Script Sprite. And there we see Ron reading the Walulu Wolf again, so it's not a problem yet. Why, uh, why Lily, by the way, an anagram of Lily Wu, the first wife of Richard Garfield. Yeah, and Ron really in the tank here. And this is kind of the kind of magic I like. I like it when there are combat situations. You know, because you really have to think. And it makes the game just very interesting. Ooh, look at that. Ron's getting aggressive. And I think that's because of the Diamond Valley. He knows that if need be, he can use his Diamond Valley to cash in for four lives, sacking one of his birds or his Suchi. And that's so important. Ooh, but he is changing his mind, though. He's untapping again. Interesting. 
Is he gonna also animate the factory? He does, okay, wow. That is quite interesting. Attacking, attack, wow, a mega, like an alpha strike. Remember, the Suchi is still a summoning sickness. Look at the life total of Martine. Martine's on 11. This is huge. And basically, Ron is saying, you know what? I want you to use your Waludi wolves to chump block. I don't want you to use those wolves against me. I don't want that to happen. This is an interesting block. Ooh, there go the Waluli Wolves. I wonder if Martijn has a giant growth in hand. So now he's declared his blocks, so he's definitely going to take 4 damage from one of the bird tokens. And now, of course, Martijn is going to use his Pendlehaven, okay, on the Wolf, so it's going to be a 2-3. I'm expecting Ron here to sack his factory, perhaps, to the Atok. And what card is that? Is it hard to see with the glare? That is a Berserk. Really? Is he playing a Berserk on there? That surprises me a little bit, because then you're making an 8-4 Trample. That means Martijn's going to take seven points of damage from that bird, four points of damage from the other bird, he's dead. It's probably not the best decision to make here. Perhaps that's what they're talking about as well. Now remember, old school is a very relaxed format where players sometimes even help each other out and saying, you know what, if you do this, you actually die. <laughs> so, this is pretty sweet. I wonder if there is something I'm missing here. Because in my understanding, Berserk gives the power, it doubles the power and it gives Trample. So it's then an 8-4 bird with Trample, blocked by a 1-1. One, one. That means he's gonna die, right? Because he's gonna take 7 damage from that, then 4 damage from the bird. Together that's 11. Maybe I'm missing something here. So he's first he's sacking. Looks like he's going to sack the Mishra's factory, so he's going to gain two more life. A little bit in, in a discussion here, perhaps. I think Martijn is still thinking, what should I do with this Berserk? It looks like Ron's going to sack the factory to the Diamond Valley, so he's going to gain two more life. He's going to go up to 12. I really wonder what's going to happen here. Okay, perhaps what Martijn did was play the Berserk on... Okay, he's on three. Wow, that's so interesting. Perhaps I missed something here. Because, in my understanding, if it was on 11, he should have died, right? Like a rook is a 4-4 four, four bird. Interesting. Let me know in the comments below if I'm missing something. Anyway, both players agree. What could have happened, of course, is that he used his Pendlehaven on the script sprite. And then he took 9 points. That, that, could, that could be a possibility. That could be a possibility. Anyway, both players are, <laughs> are still playing. Martijn's on three and Ron's on 12. And uh, Martijn playing out another uh, potential blocker in the form of a Mishra's factory. I mean, he's still, Martijn's still alive. He's hanging on a threat though, but he's still alive. Remember, this is just the first game. And it is a pretty exciting one. Both players really taking their time to think about their moves and understandable, understandably so because there's a lot of uh, combat maps going on here. There, there's an ice storm on the Diamond Valley. I think that's a very good decision. It's interesting to see Martijn playing with this green deck. He's almost playing it more like a control player than like an aggro player. And maybe that's uh, the reason why he is still alive. Passing turn here. Ron untapping. 
Another Diamond Valley A top deck. That is a little bit unfortunate. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but it's just annoying to play against Diamond Valley because it can just net your opponent so much life. There's an attack with the 4-4 Flying Bird. Is Ron, no, Ron cannot, oh, sorry, Martin cannot take the damage. He's on three, he's got a block with the Pixie. I mean, he can make it a 3-4, but that's not enough. I mean, if he's got... Yeah, it's just John blocking. I want to say, if he's got a giant growth with the Wally the Wolf, he can make it into a 5-5, five, five, kill the bird. That would be ideal for Mertang. Nope, that's it. Okay, wow. And uh, I'm going to try to go back to that combat uh, situation with you to kind of have a look together and listen to the audio to see what was actually uh, going on during that play. So let's do a little bit of a replay. And in the meanwhile, these players are going to shuffle up and going to go to their sideboards and see what they're going to use in game number two. So while we are looking at the footage again, I've listened a few times very closely to hear what they're actually saying because there's so much background noise. So it was hard to see, but I could hear Ron and Martin kind of discussing the play. What happened is uh, I guess Martin made a little mistake with the map, so he played it on that 4-4 bird token that he was blocking with the Pixies. That would mean it would be turned into an 8-4 with Trample, and he would get 11 damage exact because the other 4-4 bird token wasn't blocked. So Ron said, well, I think then that you're going to die, so if you want to, you can take the Berserk back. And Martin said, no, 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 I've already played it. I'm not going to take it back, uh, but I'm just going to change the target. So he changed the target to the other 4-4 bird token that wasn't blocked, so that's why he's only taking... Eight points of damage, and that's why also one of the bird tokens dies. So, mystery solved. That's why he's on three. Um, anyway, now we know what happened. We can uh, we can safely go to game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So we've got Martin on the play, which is good. There's an Asp, pretty good. A one-one creature from Arabian Nights. And the cool thing is, when it hits, okay, it's gone already. Okay, so <laughs> let's look it up if you want to know what it does. But I like I like the creature. Anyway, quick chain lightning as an answer from Ron there. And there is a two tap, maybe Wiluli Wolf. You're oh, two separate creatures, Lanawer Elves and a Script Sprite, so 1 1 flyer. And look at that double bolt again taking care of the creature. So Ron's super aggressive going through his chains and his bolts. Just wants to get rid of every threat and kind of wants to go for the mid game here. Knows his deck is better than. And there is a Scavenger Folk. I mean, this is not too bad for Martin because they're all just 1-1 trades, right? And again, I understand the decision from Ron. who's like, okay, the longer this game will take, the more chances I have of actually winning this one. So Ron now taking turn number three, looking at his hand. Just those two bolts and a chain and a pass turn. Okay, this kind of offers an opening to Martin here. So Ron missing a land drop. Is he going to activate the factory? Exactly, he's going to swing in here. Maybe we're going to see a Shatter. There is the attack. And... Okay, there we see another Bolt. Ooh, saving it here with a Giant Grove. This is a pretty big deal because he's not only saving his Mishra's Factory, he's also dealing extra damage to Ron here. This is a great play by Martin. And look at the life total now. All of a sudden, Ron's finding himself on, on 14. I mean, it's not dangerous, but... It could become dangerous in a couple of turns. There's a strip mine that could be pretty crucial because that strip mine, of course, is a great answer to the Mishra's factory. I guess he just top decked that strip mine because he missed a land drop prior. Activating it again, kind of luring out a potential strip mine. But there's a tap for three, though, and there's a psionic blast. So here you can see that Ron really values his lands right now. He doesn't want to sack that strip. He wants to get up to four mana. And, uh, and start playing a potential Suchi or Rook Egg, having some blockers. He knows how important that is. Of course, the downside here for Ron is that despite the fact that he takes away a threat, he also takes two damage from that Psionic Blast. So he drops to 11 here, also taking a damage from the Scavenger Folk. And here we see, oh, I, I expected a Rook Egg here. We're not seeing a Rook Egg though. A Time Twister. Ooh, and this is a little bit risky. I mean, I get Ron because he's shuffling back all his direct damage. And uh, next turn, he can untap with enough lands to start doing some stuff. And of course, that Diamond Valley is really, really good. If he can get to four mana, he can find a Rook Egg. He can gain some extra life and a 4-4 four, four Flyer, which would be ideal right now. But I, I'm still seeing chances for Martin here. Because of course, Martin is also getting a full hand. All those creatures that were destroyed, he's shuffling them back in. 
And I mean, remember, his deck doesn't need a lot of mana. I think those three forests are more than enough to do whatever he wants to do. So that's pretty great here for Martijn as well. And, you know, Ron stepped out here, so he's got a pass turn. So that means that Martijn can untap with a full hand, full grip of cards. And can Ron find some jewelry here? You know, maybe a Mox or a Lotus so that he can quickly play something out. I believe he already played a land for turn. That was that Diamond Valley. There's a Mox Jet. There's a Black Vice. Interesting. So he didn't pour it out his Vices. Which is something that perhaps I would have done. But I'm sure Ron has his reasons. He, of course, does play with some sack outlets. And, of course, uh, Black Vice is great with Time Twister and Wheel of Fortune. There we see a Pendlehaven. So now he can swing in for two, putting Ron on nine. And that's exactly, is he going to do that? Ooh. There we see a Giant Grove. Wouldn't it have been better? Another Giant Grove, seven. And a Berserk. That, ooh, no. And a Berserk. There's the Berserk. Wow. Look at this. Wow. That means he's dealing 20 damage in one hit. 11 is already enough, but this was 20 points of damage. And I think Ron kind of knew I'm taking a risk here with the Twister, but I'm behind as is. And it's better to take a risk here playing towards my outs than, uh, yeah, you know, get killed slowly. So, um, wow, 1-1. One, one. Well done, uh, Martin. And I guess that means that we're going to game number three. Game number three. Here we go. So Martin on the left, Ron on the right, now on the play. Starting here with a Mishra's Factory, and there's that Black Vice again, and a pass turn. So that's a pretty good start. Means that Martijn's going to drop to 17 here. So it's kind of like a free bolt. That's always the way I look at it. Well, it's not free, but it's an extra bolt, I should say. Anyway, there's the Lanawar Elves from Martijn. There is a Plateau. There again, a lot of bolts here taking care of that Lanawar. Which I think is a good move because Lanawar Elf, of course, also a ramp up. You know, with Lanawar Elf, potentially Martin could have played an Ice Storm, for example, in his second turn. Now he cannot because the Lanawar is gone. Taking two damage from the Vice. And he's snapping his fingers a little bit. Doesn't mean that he's making a tough decision. Playing a Factory, playing Elves of Deep Shadow in a past turn. So no damage dealt by Martin so far to Ron. Ron here tapping the plateau and yep, there's a chain lightning. And there's a pass. Taking, I believe, one point of damage now from the vice. Five in hand, going to 14. Drawing a card for turn. Playing a forest from the uh, top deck, that one. Are we gonna see an ice storm here? Playing an ice storm on the plateau and a pass. Ooh, finding a Batlands at the top. So that is lucky here for Ron. Finding the mana. Is he going to animate an attack for two here? It's kind of like a free attack since uh, Martin is all tapped out. So taking two more points of damage, going to 12. So Martin's already quite low, actually, because of the damage from the Vice and now an extra two points of damage from the Factory. So looking at his hand, what can he do here? Tapping two, are we going to see a Wailuli Wolf? Yep, yeah, there's a Wailuli Wolf. And another tap down for a Scavenger Folk in the pass. A Scavenger Folk, of course, very good against the Mishra's Factory. And I wonder if Ron's going to attack now with the 2-2. Two -two. I mean, it's very unlikely that Martin would make a trade to Wailuli Wolf and the Scavenger Folk. On the other hand, it could be worth to take away a creature in the land. So I, I don't think Ron's going to take the chance here. He's looking at his hand, trying to find out what he can do. Still very low on Lance. I mean, if you're Ron here, you would definitely prefer to just have a Mox in hand or at least a Mana Source of some sort. His deck needs more Lance than just two. I mean, Martin's deck can kind of function on two lands, but for Ron, it's, it's a whole different story. Tapping, and there we see a Bolt. So a bolt on the scavenger in a way that makes sense because the scavenger is just really, really good against the factory. But I understand why Ron was kind of in the tank because he also could have used the bolt, of course, against the Waluli Wolf, who could be very, very annoying. 
And he could, of course, also use it against this creature, the Mishra's Factory. So now he can swing in, pump it up, dealing three points of damage. So the first blood here on the side of Ron is dropping to 17. And Ron picking up another card. I mean, can he find Lance? If he cannot find Lance, okay, there's a Loa. I'm actually not quite sure how many cards he's got in hand. I think he's counting it right now. Martin asking. We still don't know though. We'll just have to see. If he uses it, we know he's got seven. But it's always tricky with Loa if you don't have seven in hand yet, but you're kind of close. Uh, but you're also under pressure. I guess he's still got 17 lives though. So it's, it's, it's not that he's under that much pressure. And he's got the Mishra's Factory to block as well. I mean, next turn is going to be very interesting. For example, Mertan could animate his factory attack and then Ron can block and make his factory a 3-3 and then Mertan can use the Wolu the Wolf and they can trade that way, but I'm not sure if Ron really wants to because he don't want to lose any more lands because he's already so light on lands. Looking at his hand now, by the way, it looks like he's got four cards in hand, perhaps five. I mean, this is a really tough position for Ron to be in, so it makes sense that he's taking his time here trying to find out what's the, what the best line of play is. At least the Loa gives him a mana, you know, at least it's a colorless mana. And tapping three, oh, there's a mind twist for two. Not the end of the world, I guess. If you're Martin, I mean, at least you now know that you can kind of have a free attack next turn. He's gonna lose two cards here. There's a crumble and there's a giant growth. Ooh, the giant growth is really, Kind of nice for Ron here. Giant Grove, such a good card in the deck of Martin, especially in combination with the Berserk. We saw that in game two. Tapping three, interesting. Yep, another Ice Storm taking care of the only colored land, which I think is a great decision. I mean, he's only dealing one damage, yes, but he really needs to try to make sure that Ron doesn't have the land that he wants. Remember, his deck, when you look at his deck, he kind of needs you know, four mana. Now he's animating it, hitting Martang for two, so at least Martang's kind of low on life. You know, that's something for Ron to kind of cling on to, but it's not ideal. Animating the factory, attacking with both here. Gonna drop Ron to 13. And then he's playing an Asp, and that Asp is actually right now pretty good. So what the Asp does, it deals one damage, and then if you don't pay an extra mana, the opponent that is that you're damaging, if it doesn't pay one before the next upkeep, you take an extra point of damage. Because you're kind of like bitten by a snake. So potentially it can deal two damage. And I think that's kind of difficult here for, for ooh, he's finding an, an underground sea. That's actually pretty decent. There's a time twister again. So again, we saw it in game two, it didn't work out for Ron. Now we're seeing it in game number three. And actually in kind of the same scenario where you know, Ron is stepped out. This is super, super risky. Remember, Martin is playing with Giant Groves. He's playing with Berserks. If he can find the right combination of cards, this game could be over next turn. Very interesting. But what I wanted to say is what the Asp then does, it kind of reserves a land on the side of Ron. He's already quite low on land. So it can be super annoying at the right time, at the right moment. So things are looking up for, for Martin here, actually. I give him a, a big chance to win this because he gets to draw seven fresh cards. Again, Ron is all tapped out, already played a land for turn. I mean, if Ron's lucky here, he get to find his Mox or a Black Lotus would be even better. Let's see what he can find. And he's just passing turn here, nothing. Remember, he's playing with a lot of Mox and and also with the Black Lotus, but just not finding anything. At least he's taking damage from the Vice, by the way, Martin. I completely forgot about that. So he is dropping to seven. So Martin really wants to empty his hand here. But I actually think that he's got a really good chance of finishing it right here on the spot. Remember what he did in game number two? He won after that time twister. So here we see Mertang going through the motion, trying to find out the right path to victory. I mean, he's got to have tons of options. Remember, his deck is full of one drops and two drops. 
Playing at Pendlehaven, that's already pretty good. Can give one of his 1-1s one plus 1 plus 2. So the way it sits right now, he can already deal 5 points of damage. But I'm sure he's going to play out more. He's got 6 in hand now, or 7 still, by the way, because of course he drew a card for turn as well. So he really wants to empty his hand. Look at his life total, it's on 7. You don't want to drop to 4 against a player who plays with psionic blasts. That is just super, super risky. If you're Martin, you just want to finish it right now. You don't want to let Ron untap with a full grip of cards. He's animating. There's the attack. And again, he's not using the Pendlehaven. Looks like he's taking the damage, though. I expected maybe a Bloodlust or a Giant Grove, but it is not coming. Tapping, playing a Scripps Rites in the past. That's it. Wow, I think Ron is really lucky here. Ron can count his blessings. That means that I believe Martin is six cards up. So he will drop to five because of that vice, probably. And then, you know, he's very close to death. He's at least still in the safe zone uh, when you think about that Psionic Blast. Like on five, it means after Psionic Blast, he would still be on one, which is something. But of course, Ron can now, well, if he attacks with the factory, though, he's probably not going to do that. Because Martang kept his Pendlehaven open and that Scripps Sprite, so he can pump the Scripps Sprites to a 2-3. And Ron again looking at his hand, I see an Atog there. And there is a Badland, so there is a red source. And it looks like he drew a card too many. Ooh, this is interesting. Not quite sure what's, what's happening here. Putting his card in order somehow. Looking at his life total. Okay, I guess he should be on eight for some reason. Now he's drawing the card for turn. Oh, of course, he should be on 8 because this is the Asp that I was talking about. Duh, I just explained to you how the Asp works. So, what well, you can see here, this is quite kind of nice. Ron doesn't want to invest that one land, you know, that one mana to prevent the Asp damage. So, the Asp can actually be pretty good. Playing a bad lance here. I mean, if he's got a Bolt and a Side Blast, this game is over. It can be really, really fast. There we see the Atok. And there we see a time walk. Ooh, this is so unfortunate. What is he going to do? Is he going to crumble the vice here? Yes, he's going to crumble the vice. I think also to make sure that Ron cannot use the vice next turn to pump the Atog. So he's going to feed it to the Atog. He's going to gain a life. He's going to go up to nine again. But this time walk came at a fantastic moment. He's going to draw for turn. He couldn't detect with the Atok because it still had summoning sickness. Going to go through his hand. I believe he's got seven again. He could use the Loa, but maybe he wants to use it for mana, though. And there is a bolt on the sprites. There is a Mox Sapphire. And there's a vice again. I believe five cards in hand here for uh, for Martin. So he's going to drop to six next turn. There's an animate and an attack. Three damage here. He's going to go to four. Oh, he's going to sack all his artifacts to the Atok. He's got this one. Oh, ho. it took me a moment to realize that. Wait a minute. Uh, he's got Atok on the field. He can win this. Wow, wow, wow. I have to be honest. Um, after I saw Martin untap and not take the game in that turn right after the time twister, I already thought, okay, this is going to be super difficult for Martin. Now it's really like the game really changed there. And I think that was the biggest difference between game two and game three is what happened after that time twister. You know, we saw that time twister in game two. It meant the quick victory for Martin. We saw the same thing happening in game three, but Martin still he had good cards, but not as good as in, uh, in, in game number two, and that's why, uh, why he ended up losing. 
Anyway, a great and entertaining match. Thank you to Martijn and of course to Ron for playing right here on the channel and enjoying this great tournament, the Pelicans of the North Cup. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed the match. Let me know in the comments below if you liked it or not, what you liked about it, all that stuff. By commenting, by the way, you are helping the channel moving forward. And now let's take a look at the matches of next week. You can already see them here on the screen. We've got Trolling Hippies versus Blue Bots, and that match is coming up uh, this Friday. So make sure to keep an eye on the channel. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and ring that bell. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And of course, if you're a returning visitor, welcome back. Please like and comment and share this video on your socials. All that really helps. Now, there's one more thing that you can do. That's actually kind of a big deal. As you can see, this uh, match was recorded with a really high quality camera. I'm actually saving up for a quality camera. This one is Dion's. Thank you very much, D. For, uh, for letting me use your camera for this uh, for these matches. But I'm hoping to save up to get a really good one to use as a stream camera and of course as a camera to record the matches on at these tournaments. And if you wanna help me get to that goal, please consider becoming a patron via Patreon. There's probably a link popping up right now. And if you click on that link, you can find out how you can support me and my channel. And uh, it already starts with $1 a month. So it's not this huge, big number you can also pay annually i know that some people really prefer that because then you only pay like extra uh bank transfer cost once so that's also an option you can just make an annual donation so all that is really really appreciated i feel really 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 blessed already that i have i think about 130 patrons at the moment which is fantastic they actually allow me with that money one of the things i can do is travel to tournaments like this um, you know, and, and give you the uh, the live streams from those events and of course make these videos out of them afterwards. Anyway, um, if you want to become a patron or if you're considering becoming one, please click on the info card and uh, yeah, give my Patreon a visit. Maybe it's something for you. There are a couple of cool perks. Uh, you get to join the Discord, you get to join the Timmy Talks tournaments that I organize every other month or so. And of course, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. Talking about the end scroll, let's go there and take a look at our fantastic, wunderbar, amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Here we go. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomaar kan zien.